But anyway, uh, John read this whole book so <laughs> about Samantha Power. So I don't want to uh, belabor um, impeachment too much, other than, you know. But uh, it's happening. Yeah, it is. It is incredible to think of like Joe Biden being the nominee and running on the platform of you know like I'll take us back from these horrible days of Trump's lurid, insane corruption and return us to the banal, more day-to-day corruption that we had before, especially with my son. Like, that's just not a, like a winning policy. Well, John, I mean, that, that uh, actually is like, you know, segues nicely with uh, your review of uh, Samantha Power's memoir. Uh, you, you write about, um, uh, beginning here, you say, when talking about U.S. foreign policy, Republicans use transparent lies that insult the intelligence of every American. By contrast, Democrats respect their fellow citizens enough to tell more complex lies, ones that sound plausible as long as you don't think about them for more than three seconds. Power's book hews strongly to this tradition. Um, So I guess before we get into her memoir, I don't think you can understand a memoir from hell until you understand really like her entire career and the book that really put her on the map, A Problem from Hell. Uh, John, you're familiar with that book, right? Yeah, no, I, I read A Problem from Hell long ago. It came out in 2003, and, you know, she'd been a foreign correspondent and had been horrified by what she'd seen in the Balkans when Yugoslavia was falling apart and there were tons of massacres all over the place. And so she came back to the United States and she went to law school at Harvard and she decided she was going to write a book like, why, why does the United States stand by while terrible things are happening all over the world? And so she ended up writing this book, A Problem from Hell, and... It's it, it, like it's an interesting look at U.S. foreign policy. Like, why did we ignore the Armenian genocide and the Holocaust and Saddam Hussein, you know, killing the Kurds in the 1980s and Rwanda? But there's one specific thing which is missing from her book, which is not the genocides that we witnessed and did nothing about, but the genocides and war crimes that we carried out. Like, like they they barely appear in the book. There's nothing about like. like the Korean War, we killed like 20% of the population of uh, what's now North Korea during that. There's very little about Vietnam. There's nothing whatsoever in her 2003 book about Indonesia, where there was a military coup that we supported, and then we supported uh, the killing of like half a million or a million people afterwards. There's yeah, nothing about anyone who's Guatemala. seen a, Anyone who's seen the act of killing and the look of silence, uh, you know, can fill in that gap in her book with uh, that movie. But yeah, again, this was an example of like a, a genocide. I mean, it was directed against a, ch- a lot of Chinese immigrants in Indonesia at the time, but it was basically like a political genocide that was carried out against anything that was even remotely left wing in Indonesia, like from actual communists to like, you know, anyone in a trade union or just political activists of any kind whose names were being given to death squads, literally from the U S embassy at the time. Like they were the ones supplying them with the lists of Communist Party members who would, yeah, literally just be like macheted to death and thrown into a river en masse. Yeah. And, you know, what's funny about this and her leaving this out of her book is that it actually does appear briefly in Barack Obama's book, in in Dreams from My Father, because he and his mother and his stepfather moved to Indonesia in 1966. So like right after this happened and he talks about it and he acknowledges like basically the CIA knew about it. And he recorded, you know, an audiobook version of that. And you can listen to the future president of the United States talking about it, but, but not Samantha Power. So, yeah, uh, she she talks about, yeah, basically the, a book about how U.S. policy has dealt with a genocide in the post-World War II era, but omits every example of the United States or its proxies carrying out genocide. Is that just an easier problem to solve for her? Is it just like, oh, we shouldn't do that? You know, like, it's an interesting question. Like, she obviously does know what the United States has done. Like, she wrote something in 2003, you know, like, in the New Republic, which, you know, for normal people, who cares? But for people like Samantha Power, you know, that's like being on the cover of Time magazine uh, or, like, back when that mattered. And she, she, she talked about, um, you know, how us foreign policy had to be rethought, had to be overhauled. Like we need a historical reckoning with crimes committed, sponsored or permitted by the United States. And then she just listed all the things that we were just talking about. So she knew that they happened. She just consciously somehow omitted them from her book. And that's why the book won, uh, like I would say, the Pulitzer Prize yeah, for yeah. not asking too many questions. Um, 
how also did her experience, um, like you said, as a foreign correspondent in the Balkans, like you said, like that, that really shaped not just like her, you know, perspective on the world, but like, you know, set her on the path to being a, you know, yeah, national security advisor or what is she, uh, ambas- UN ambassador? What did she do? She was the, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. during Obama's second term. And in this first term, she was on the National Security Council in the White House. Yeah. Then like, you know, set her, her mind at work of like, you know, how can we use uh, U.S. foreign policy to, you know, prevent these kinds of massacres from happening? And like, because uh, you talk about how like the during the, the, the Clinton administration, like, the the Balkans was really the kind of like test case for this model of uh, humanitarian intervention or like using U.S. state and military power to, you know, uh, stop massacres and bad things from happening. Yeah, well, so she was uh, like she went to Yale and as she says, like she was just interested in sports and didn't really care about politics at all. And then when she had some summer job at a television station in 1989, she saw the famous footage in, you know, in Tiananmen Square where there, were, there was the guy who stood in front of the tank. And like, she was really moved by that. And she got a poster of the guy standing in front of the tank. And, and then she started seeing things like you know, photographs of victims of the various massacres in the former Yugoslavia. And it's kind of fascinating like, seeing that like, this, this really moved her. And she was like, what's going on? I've got to do something about these terrible crimes against human rights. And apparently she never asked the question at that time or maybe after, like during this period when she was seeing these horrible things happening to people, there were other horrible things happening to other people all over the world. Like why were, was it these specific things that were on TV? You know, in 1989, you know, El Salvador massacred a bunch of Jesuits in a really famous killing in San Salvador, a, a bunch of Jesuit priests she didn't see that on TV and get really upset about it. Uh, During the time that Yugoslavia was falling apart, uh, Turkey was using U S arms to massacre tons of Kurds, like tens and tens of thousands of Kurds. Like apparently that was also not in the U S media to make her upset. So she doesn't ever ask the question like, like why is this the stuff that is being presented to us to be upset about? And, and, you know, it's something because like, you know, if nobody, (laughs) Outside of, you know, Elliot Abrams, the last guy we talked about, nobody really likes massacres and would like, you know, prefer it if, you know, countries didn't do them or, if, you know, in some vague way, like, oh, if like we're a very powerful, wealthy country that could stop, you know, these people from being killed, like, shouldn't we do it? Like, what, what, how, what, like, what are the lessons Samantha Powers draws from like, is it that like we should always err on the side of action when it comes to, uh, you know, stopping these kind of dramatic human rights abuses, but like only in very specific areas that you know, NATO and the national security elites uh, think are important. She never is, is explicit about this. You know, I mean, she, like, I always, I look at this and I think of like the section in Lord of the Rings when Sam gets to carry the ring for a short period of time, if you know what I'm talking about. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. So, so, and, and, you know, beautifully enough, like she goes by Sam that everybody calls her Sam instead of Samantha. And so if you go and look at that passage, like referring to Sam, it fits her perfectly where like all of a sudden he has in his hands the power to do right, like, like to vanquish evildoers. And he just has to put on the ring and it can all be his. And I think that, you know, like that, that's a really interesting and kind of profound piece of writing about how power seduces us, not just by playing on our worst instincts, but by playing on our best instincts, like like wanting to help other people. And she doesn't ever seem to have like like very deeply considered that. And like how how does she like view um like NATO intervention in the Balkans as kind of like a as like a test case for or like a model for how the United States and its allies should com- you know comport itself going forward? Well, you know, she she definitely wanted the United States to do something. Uh, you know, from a certain perspective, she thought even what the United States did was too little, too late. And then she ended up, of course, in the White House. And when she was in the White House, this you know, during our overthrow of the Libyan government, like she was there. She hadn't left for the UN yet. I mean, she was in the room when it happens. But she's not as gung ho <laughs> about that anymore. And what she wants us to know about Libya is like. Uh, lots of people said that I was one of the people pushing for that. That's not really true. And also lots of bad things have happened since, but they probably would have happened anyway. 
Right. So like, so a, a problem from hell like sort of sets up her sort of her, her moral vision for foreign policy, but only does so by, you know, these vast and glaring omissions. Um, and like, you know, she just like edits that out of her consciousness or like just doesn't present it as part of a case for how to understand how U.S. policy functions. Um, and then basically she repeats that exact same technique in her memoir where she just doesn't talk about these huge, huge glaring issues that were not things that were taking place in the world that she was witnessing, but things that were taking place during the Obama administration that she was a part, like that she was part of and like actually an active participant in. So like in a way it's even, even worse. It is incredible. It is exactly the same thing as a problem from hell. Like in her book, in her new memoir, she doesn't say anything about Obama's massive campaign of drone strikes. She says nothing about Israel bombing Gaza during the time she was there. And there were like three main bombing campaigns and, you know, like who knows how many other minor ones. Uh, There's nothing about the Saudi war on Yemen, which is like truly as grotesque as the Syrian war. And the United States, you know, it would not happen without the United States. Uh, there's nothing about like talking about Yugoslavia. So purportedly this is you know, the place where she learned about the world and, and why the United States had to do good. She doesn't mention this crazy fact, which I've never heard anybody anywhere talk about, which is that during the Obama administration, the prime minister of Kosovo came to visit the white house and Joe Biden met with him, and there's a picture of the two of them being super chummy in front of a portrait of George Washington. And Joe Biden called him the George Washington of Kosovo. Well, he'd been head of the Kosovo Liberation Army during the 1990s. And the Council of Europe, which is a group of like just boring bureaucrats who do not go out on a limb and make claims that are not fully documented, the KLA, like, like they were involved in huge amounts of coke. Uh, I, I guess it was heroin smuggling in Europe during that time to make money. And that's all, you know, that's standard in wars like that. But the KLA was also killing prisoners of war and selling their organs. This is the guy, the Council of Europe referred to it as like, like kind of less a army and more of a mafia. This guy was in charge of that, of the killing people and selling organs. And Joe Biden is there in the White House with him. And this is supposedly like she's super into the Balkans. She's really interested in that. That does not come up. I want to go into uh, the examples of Libya and Yemen, like like and, and her roles in both of those things, and like why the fact that she doesn't bring them up in her her memoir is so galling. But another thing that she doesn't mention at all in her memoir is she doesn't describe anything about her very sort of chummy, friendly relationship with Henry Kissinger. Does he show yeah, well, up? Does he show up at, at all in the book? Does she talk about going to Yankees games with him, receiving an award named after him, being given to her by him? Well, who who among us can say we haven't been to a Yankees game with a war criminal? I mean, it it is incredible. He appears nowhere. Like I had to get the, uh, the Kindle edition of the book so I could search it and make sure that I hadn't missed anything, like any Kissinger reference. But no. You know, obviously, he's one of the 20th century's premier war criminals. And I guess they're buddies now. Like, like they did go to this Yankees game. She didn't try to cover it up. She, like, she tweeted it. Oh, no, they, like, they had pictures. Out. She was sharing it on the timeline. Like, it, like, again, like, she can't not be aware of how people view Henry Kissinger and how, I don't know, hypocritical it is for her as, like, the human rights, ad, you know, premier human rights warrior uh, in the American government to be seen um, having such a close friendship with this guy. She can't not be aware of that, but like is it, she must just not care or she doesn't see it that way. To be or- fair though, none of the war crimes that Henry Kissinger was directly responsible for ended up on American television. So she might not know about them. It is like she kind of like jokes about it. Like she doesn't say this exactly, but it's like, look at us. We sure are an odd couple. Uh, <laughs> but uh, she, she's never addressed it as far as I know. And I guess just once you get to that level of U S foreign policy, you know, you're, you understand how hard it is to make these difficult decisions. I mean, this is also something you, you, you mentioned in your review where like, it's sort of like this idea that like, okay, to, like I said, to, to, to wear the, the ring of power, 
So like to get in the position of UN ambassador or on the National Security Council where you're in the room making the decisions to uh, you know, save these thousands of people or end this famine, et cetera, et cetera, uh, do the good that you want to do in the world. It's sort of like there's an understanding that well, like to do that, you also you know are going to have to torture some folks. You're also going to have to like you know kiss the ring of Saudi Arabia and let them do you know all of their atrocities. If you want to save the other atrocities, like you're going to have to let some other atrocities happen as well. And like that's just look, it's a complicated world, and like that's just the way it is. And like are you, you either can complain about it or you can try to do the good that you can do in the world. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, I do think that if she had been honest about this, about the trade offs as she saw them, like it could have been an unbelievably interesting book. And I do think that like it's it's kind of easy for us because like, I think the chances are pretty good. Like none of us are ever going to be the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. You know, we, we, we don't have to ever think about these questions. And like people like us also just don't have to think about the world in general, like how, like how should the world work? How would you like, would you restructure the UN? Would you have some sort of like super national force that would go around the world trying to say, like, these are questions that we never have to think about. And as long as we live, like the world will be so far away from that. Like it'll be kind of irrelevant, but for somebody like her, like it is interesting. Like, was it worth it to her? And as I say, like, she was absolutely complicit in evil. There's no question about that. But she also talks about like maybe having stopped a genocide in the Central African Republic before it started. And she also was helping organize like the U.S. response, leading an international response to an outbreak of Ebola. And if she hadn't been willing to do these terrible things, she never would have been there. And like that, that would be an amazing book to hear from somebody who was like, they're in the room and is making the case for why it was worth it or why it wasn't. And uh, she doesn't do it. And so it's just like unbelievably boring. I think part of that is because if you gave away the game that way and said, this is a, this is a, there's no virtuous way to do this because we're administering this global empire. It's going to require tough choices by definition uh, because, you know, we have all these stakeholders and all these different regions and they have their specific on the ground, uh, aims and we have to support them or else you know somebody else is going to come in uh if you're making that pitch if you're making that realpolitik argument about how power really works it kind of undermines your idea that america is inherently virtuous and that america's foreign policy actions have an inherent virtuosity to them uh and that is one of the key propaganda buttons they press in order to get people on board for the next time they need to intervene somewhere you also couldn't call the book an education of an idealist. Yeah. It would have to be like uh, the cynic's guide to power or yeah. something like that. Like the cynic's guide to doing good in the world or some bullshit like that. Yeah, you know, one of the things that like, you know right off the bat that it's not going to be very interesting because she never talks about the fact that her last name is Power. <laughs> <laughs> like it really is. It's like somebody it's like a, is it's writing like a, a book. Dickens character or something. Yeah. Like I've always thought that about her and like, like Anna Marie Slaughter. Uh, if you oh, know man. who she is like oh she's yeah of course yeah. Person of this type and like it really is like somebody writing a book and it's like this this is my memoir about my life and what i've done and my last name is cruelty my first name <laughs> vicious uh and i ended up as like china's chief torturer <laughs> and so i just take people apart piece by piece and oh what's that you're saying it's kind of ironic that i have that i i'd never seen it like that before or, or like cruelty. the opposite, like, you know, I read a law, I read a memoir about like a lifetime of upholding law and order. My name, Bob Crime Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So like she just never talks about that. And uh, that lets you know like who she is right from the beginning. So, you know, in, in this memoir, like in the specific examples of, you know, of, of when she was in power and, you know, she had her hand like, you know, at the switch, it was in the room making these decisions. Uh, the big one, of course, is Libya. Because uh, you talk about, like, what, what her role was in the Obama administration's intervention in Libya. Well, there's her version of it, which appears in this book. And then the coverage just in the New York Times and the Washington Post and elsewhere at the time and since. Like, at the time, the reporting was about how she was one of the main supporters of the U.S. intervening 
in Libya, which of course meant that we were going to overthrow the Libyan government, even though we were pretending at the time that that's not what was going to happen. And uh, Hillary Clinton was also reported to be one of the big supporters of that. She was secret- our- This was in the first Obama administration when Clinton was Secretary of State. Yeah, that's right. And this was like their, you know, this was like their uh, their, their their first big attempt to like use American power under a new kind of like enlightened liberal democratic regime. And again, like the, the, as I remember the, like the justification for that was of course to prevent genocide from occurring in the city of Benghazi. Cause the idea was like, if we if the U S you know, air or like NATO air force or like, if we don't start bombing, then Gaddafi's forces are going to like, you know, flood into the rebel city of Benghazi and they're just going to slaughter everyone there. And we need to stop that from happening. Like, you know, if you could press a button literally to stop a genocide from happening, you know, wouldn't you do it? Right. Exactly. And, uh, at the time everybody was saying that, you know, she was one of the main proponents power was, uh, things haven't gone super well since then in Libya and she's not especially eager in her memoir to have her name attached to it. And so she does talk about how it's like, oh, well, you know, my influence, my input has been exaggerated in news coverage. And like, if you just look at the political situation, it wasn't going to be going back to the status quo. Like if we didn't do anything, Libya was going to fall apart anyway. Lots and lots of people would have died anyway. So don't blame me. Like that, that is pretty much what she has to say. Although she does have something else like I've never seen anywhere, which is very interesting to me, is that at the time she says like they were there in the room and people were telling Obama, you know, if we overthrow the Libyan government after Libya gave up its rudimentary nuclear program during the Bush administration. That and- was like uh, listeners in the show will remember that was like one of the the funniest, best moments from the Iraq war era. This was like 2006, 2007, when like it had really, really gone to hell for the United States and Great Britain. And they were looking for like any excuse to salvage their initial justification for the war. And they got one from <laughs> the good Colonel Gaddafi, who was just basically like, yeah, I'll play along and just say, oh, guess what? I've given up my weapons of mass destruction program because of why, because of what the United States and Great Britain did to Saddam. And like what he did was just give over like, again, some like mustard gas shells from like 1955 or whatever. Yes. I'm, I'm surrendering my five test tubes. Yeah. No. And they made a big show of it. And I remember Tony Blair visited Libya and like was, you know, like and Gaddafi was like, I'm turning over the new leaf. I'm a good guy again now. And then that didn't let like that. And then it like we turned on him so quickly after he played the good guy for us uh, to again come up with a totally bullshit, you know, after the fact justification for the Iraq War. <laughs> I remember like at the time, uh, Christopher Hitchens was even going on TV talking about, well, Gaddafi's giving up his weapons of mass destruction program, so it must be working. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I mean, of course, like the rest of the world saw that in the context of you know, Saddam Hussein actually had disarmed, and we came there. And killed him, you know, <laughs> he ended up executed. Uh, then Gaddafi surrenders, you know, this rudimentary program, whatever it was. He ends up dead, not just dead, but like sodomized with a bayonet in a ditch. Uh, and the rest of the world, of course, saw this. and was like, mm, I think we're going to hold on to our nuclear weapons. And, and actually, North Korea said that specifically at the time and has said it a million times since. Like, we've seen what happens when the United States says, hey, why don't you disarm and we can live together in peace? Like, not only obviously, that, you're not only, going to end up dead. Not only that, if you're if you're Iran, look what happens when you even negotiate with America. Yeah, like never, never make that terrible mistake. Hey, don't, uh, yeah, any, don't negotiate with terrorists. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So and, so and so what's interesting about the book is that people did actually talk about that apparently at the White House at the time. Like if we overthrow Gaddafi, like that's going to send the message to the world, like never, ever disarm. And they went ahead anyway. But what about the idea that like if we overthrow Gaddafi, you know, a bad guy or whatever that he is, like, you know, as we've seen from Iraq, like the aftermath of it or like, you know, uh, like who's going to take over the country? And like and then lo and behold, it turns into just a cauldron of violence and mayhem. Yeah. And as I say, she, she doesn't want to take ownership of that for very So, so she, she really backs away from the, the Libyan intervention in the book. Like, like how does she, she just says like my role in this has been overstated. Yeah. Her role in it has been overstated. It was a very complicated situation. It was difficult to know what the right course of action would have been. 
And as I say, she just like basically t- like takes the position that every, everything would have been awful. Like even if we'd never done anything, it would have been terrible too. So like she knows how bad it looks. And she also in the book backs away a lot from like just sort of the use of force in general by the United States, which is kind of interesting. Like she, she wants to tell us that she's been misunderstood and that people think she's the person who wants to bomb everybody for good. When actually, you know, what she really wants is for the United States to, you know, use its power in other ways to do good things. And so it's all, as I say, it's, it's just like this 550 pages of sludge. Well, here's one interesting thing. Um, that is in the book that I, I, I this is what this was in um, uh, Dexter Filkins uh, review of uh, the Samantha Power book. And uh, this is quoted by uh, Daniel Larison and the American conservative. But uh, speaking of the Libyan intervention, Power says of it and like or the, the rather disastrous aftermath of it. Uh, she says here, quote, we could hardly expect to have a crystal ball when it came to accurately predicting outcomes in places where the culture was not our own which would seem to imply that she's making a fairly airtight case against intervention. But as Larison points out, this is an argument that like, that like it's like a uh, heads I win, tails you lose argument. Because like oftentimes, if you are against U.S. military intervention, uh, the, the, the hawks or the liberal interventionists will like couch, you know, response to that critique of like, well, how do we know what's going to happen? Do you really think that you can like impose you know, uh, American standards of democracy on another country uh, overnight, they'll always say, well, you know, that's sort of like a pseudo racist argument that like, you know, Arab peoples are just not, you know, fit for democracy or like, you know, insert target of U.S. military action here. But it turns out that you can fall back on the cultural explanation when it doesn't work out. Even or like in, in, in any case, you can rely on the cultural explanation to support this argument. And she's saying here, I, like, oh, we just didn't have a crystal ball, like about what you know, like uh, we didn't we didn't understand the culture enough to understand what was going to happen. Yeah, it is incredibly shameless on her part, and just that whole like we didn't have a crystal ball. It is like, well, you know, we have this very fragile vase in our hands, and we took it and we threw it as hard as we possibly could against the wall, and it shattered. Now, who could have predicted that that would happen? We didn't have a crystal ball. But remember, all of those people, I mean, they would have died eventually anyway. That's the Megan McCardle argument. I mean, imagine, really imagine 300 years from now. Yeah. They, like, yeah, none, they, all those people would be, be dead. dead. And it's just uh, as Larryson writes here, the, the truth is that Libyan war supporters weren't concerned about what happened later. That would be someone else's problem. They had their good intervention and they declared that it had worked. And then Libya and its neighbors paid the price for their self-congratulation. It honestly feels like one, part of the real motives for the Libya intervention was to basically provide a counterexample to Iraq so that intervention didn't get too deeply yes. discredited by like the American public. That like like we were worried about like another Vietnam syndrome kicking in and being like, oh shit, we can't make people just the last intervention can't have been this catastrophic Iraq thing. What about some like a Rumsfeldian dream thing with just air support, no boots on the ground, but still successful? And then we could tell people, see, this will be the model that we can pitch the next time we need to do one. Is this thing that worked? Yeah, I mean, there, there's no question that she's part of the wing of the foreign policy establishment, which sees, you know, like, well, on the one hand, there's bombing countries. And then on the other hand, there's invading countries. And there is n- no third option. And we have to make sure that people are, are behind at least one of those two options. So uh, moving on from uh, the disaster that was the Libyan intervention to the ongoing atrocity and you know, human rights catastrophe that is the war in Yemen. Again, this took place while she was UN ambassador. Like the, this, you know, started heating up like, you know, again, like in towards the end of the Obama administration, but it was definitely ongoing. Does she have nothing to say at all about that in the book? Or like, how did does she bring it up at all? Uh, she has, she, there are two references to Yemen in the book. Uh, in the first, she, she, she lists the countries on planet Earth where it's illegal to be gay. There are, <laughs> there, there are like six of them and, and Yemen is one. And then she talks about how the Russian ambassador to the UN, I, I think, made fun of, of Yemen's ambassador to the UN for taking the opinions of women seriously. 
And that's it. So no, nothing about what, you know, like the absolute genocide that the Saudis are doing there. Uh, okay, so yeah. this is this is um, this is from another review of the book. Uh, this is uh, Shireen Al Adimi in uh, in these times uh, brings up this example. Uh, while she was UN ambassador, right uh, in June 2016, Ambassador Power was asked to comment on then UN Secretary General Ban Ki Moon's stunning admission that Saudi threats to UN funding led him to remove Saudi Arabia from a list of armies responsible for killing and wounding children. Power and her staff reportedly ignored a journalist's questions about this. Since news broke of Ban's decision, I have asked Power's office for a direct response to Saudi funding threats, journalist Samuel Oakford wrote for Politico in July 2016. Neither she nor her staff ever replied. Yeah, I mean, and it's actually, it's even worse than that. Like when the war was beginning in 2015, she actually made remarks uh, at the UN Security Council basically blaming Yemen for what was going on. So now, now that she's out of office, every now and then she will get like very angry on Twitter and say bad things about Saudi Arabia and the war. But while it was happening, uh, when she was actually in office and could do something, like she did nothing whatsoever. And like this is this is why like it could have been the world's most interesting book about politics, where she could have said, "Look, look you know, Jeffrey Epstein mostly worked for Saudi Arabia, and he has compromat on." 90% of the most powerful people in the United States. And so we can't do anything about it. Like, or like what, whatever the actual truth is about our relationship with Saudi Arabia, just that we need them to keep on buying our arms in exchange for all of our oil. Like whatever the truth is, maybe it's that like, if you disavow your most vile, disgusting ally, then all of your vassal states are going to get nervous and your empire is going to wander off. Like what is the answer? Like we don't know because we weren't there, but she was. And sadly, you know, she just doesn't tell us. I mean, and also like like the fact that she now that she's out of power is getting on. I'm getting on Twitter condemning, you know, uh, Saudi war crimes in Yemen is is, is also incredibly galling because it's like not only does she not want like, like she just wants to have it always all the time. And again, it's like to to build up this image of the sort of complicated idealist or like the, uh, you know, the. Uh, the, all the horrible problems that, like, you know, American power must face, you know, reasonably and realistically in the world. Yeah, it, it, it really is. Like, as I say, it's just like it's absolutely shameless on her part. Like, I would like to know if she cares so much about this. Like, maybe she'd get she'd give the money she got from the Henry Kissinger Prize to Yemen. You know, like that would be a, that would be a nice gesture. But I haven't seen anything about that. I mean, th and that's the thing about her that is that is so incredibly distressing. Like, this is. Like like Obama, like this is apparently the best that the United States can do. And it is horrendous. It's like, you know, she's somebody who it's, it's not just that she is smart, which she is. And it's not just that she's talented, which she is. It's that she's at a position in her life where in America, in a country like America, she's basically untouchable. Like she's a tenured professor at Harvard. I believe she has tenure. She's at least a professor at Harvard. Like she could teach there for the rest of her life and tell the truth and nothing would happen to her. There, there would be no affirmative negative consequences for her. People would just withdraw the rewards. So she would never get to be secretary of state, but it's too important to her, like to maintain her viability within the system. Like whatever it was that Bill Clinton said. Uh, what, did, what did Bill Clinton say? Uh, well, you know, when, when he was explaining, like he was explaining to a friend when he was in college, or maybe he was at Oxford, like, like why he was not going to Vietnam, but also trying to get out of the draft. And it was, you know, he was doing all this fancy footwork to maintain his viability in the political system. And, you know, I, I, as you mentioned, like Secretary of State power or Senator power is certainly not something uh, to, to write off. I mean, like that, that, that could very well be in the cards for, you know, all of our futures. Um, I guess like she, I mean, again, like uh, the, the other thing about her is she is also married to uh, Cass Sustine, the kind of like pseudo libertarian economist and sort of nudge expert, much beloved by uh, neoliberal technocrats. And uh, here's a little, um, a little secret to the Chapo audience. Uh, in an episode that was lost to an audio uh, disaster, 
we read Leon Weiseltier's Wedding Toast to Cass oh, Sustein and Samantha yes. Power. Ooh. It is, I mean, fuck. We may, maybe let's just do it again in a future episode. We should, because, man. It is one of the most overwrought, Ooh. most nauseating pieces of yeah. just effluent that like you could ever come across. If you want to get at what it's like to be around these people and the monstrous regard they hold themselves in, uh, it's a really good way to feel that. I mean, like the long and the short of it, though, is that like Leon's toast to them was basically is like, we are all so, so privileged to be in this room, to be here at the joining and coming together of like the two most moral best people that America can possibly produce. And like we have a responsibility to like live up to like what being at this wedding means. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I would listen to that, except that I think I would rather die of dysentery. Uh, like, like, like this, like the book and, and that kind of thing, like really makes you understand why the Republican elite, the Republican foreign policy elite, but all of them like burn with hatred for the Democratic elite. Because, you know, as they pointed out at the time, like, yeah, sure, we tortured people, but Barack Obama would just murder them with drones. And what what the Democrats want is to do pretty much the same thing as the Republicans do, but also receive a Nobel Peace Prize and do a photo shoot for Vanity Fair. I mean, it really is unbearable. And it is the kind of thing where, you know, for a brief moment in time, at least for me, I was like, maybe I should vote for Trump. You know, like, yeah, you're right about like the, the hatred that the Republican elites like, yeah, like, you know, chainsaw Elliot Abrams has for these people because it's like. It's the, it's the old thing. Like, there's no such thing as halfway crooks. Like, how, the, how could you possibly, you know, call us evil or look down your nose or, like, you know, turn up your nose at us yeah. when you're doing the same fucking thing we are? Yeah. Like, we're, we don't, the only difference is we don't apologize for it. We don't grovel for, like, you know, NPR listeners to, you know, uh, respect or like us or at all. We know we're evil. We like being hated. Yeah. But, like, we understand that, like, this is power. Like, this is what wielding power means, and we're willing to do it. We just don't want to fucking, yeah, a medal for it. Yeah, the Kissinger is the perfect example of that. Because he would go to the White House, and he would listen to Nixon get shit-faced and talk about how, I don't give a damn about the civilian casualties, Henry. We should just bomb the goddamn dikes and and then swat and 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 uh, fucking have as many of them, however many drowned, whatever it takes, and be like, absolutely, Mr. President, you you must show strength. It is of paramount importance. And then he would go back to Cambridge and go to the dinner parties with the Harvard swaths and be like, the president he is a madman. I have to do whatever I can to constrain him. <laughs> but like, okay, like just just zooming out though, like uh, as power as just like a you know particularly good example. Of, of this type of person in, in, in America's foreign policy elite and how they're really, they're not going anywhere. And like, you know, or, you know her individually is probably going to, you know, rise to an even higher level of prominence and power in our lifetimes. I think it gets to this like larger question. And I was actually like, I have to credit uh, Catherine for this. We were talking about it the other night. It's like it's something she said to me that stuck with me. And it's this idea that like whenever you, come up against people who are, you know, have sort of experience in the world of foreign policy, international relations, you know, like the military government, like the, the wonks, if you will. And you, you know, we'll just say to them flatly, like, uh, no, like, you know, war is bad. Like America, like we're the bad guy. Like we shouldn't, like our military, yeah. like should not be doing basically anything. Like it never works out the way we want it to. We don't do good in the world. You get this thing where it's just like, no, you don't, you don't really understand. It's more complicated than that. You know, like, it's just like, you have a very simplistic view. And it's like, look, having knowledge about the world is not a bad thing. But I genuinely think when it comes to these sort of like uh, uh, clerises of like foreign policy power, the more expertise you have, the dumber you are and the more evil you are. Because like to get in that world, to be stamped and have like the... Uh, you know, go through the institutions and jobs that give you these power. Like you basically just have to come to accept whether you're aware of it or not that like, yeah, we tortured some folks. It happens. Or like all our options are bad. And like, and just like, or just like the idea that it's never a possibility that we just don't do anything. Like when you come to like something where it's just like two bad options, like just remaining neutral is never a choice. We always have to be acting and exerting power in the world. 
Yeah, well, you know, what people, uh, I've never seen anybody make any mention of this, but when Saddam Hussein was put on trial for committing genocide against the Kurds during the 1980s, and he was being asked, like, why were you dumping nerve gas on children? He's like, that would take books to explain. <laughs> like, You're just not sophisticated enough to understand these complicated questions. And uh, Madeleine Albright, actually, she was confronted when she was Secretary of State by people who were, you know, asking, you know, why are we condemning these things in one part of the world when our allies are doing similar things elsewhere? And she was like, well, you know, if if you had five hours, I could explain it to you. Like, <laughs> like it, it's, it's always our lack of sophistication. Uh, like, you, you say these things like war is bad and it's terrible to kill children, but Unfortunately, you know, for people like myself, we understand the tragic nature of history and what must be done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, th- and, th- and not only that, but these people always cast themselves. Like, it's not just like that they are willing to countenance like any amount of violence, cruelty, or evil in the world if it means that like American hegemony is preserved because they believe that, you know, hey, someone's got to do it. It might as well be us. And like, we're technically better than, I don't know, China or Russia. But like, with people like Power and like Kissinger and these people, they always have to cast themselves as kind of tragic figures in all of this. Almost like they are the real victim or like they are a victim at all of having to exercise this terrible power. As we say, as they say in our favorite movie, Casino, when Nikki's got uh, dogs his head in the vice <laughs> and he's like, give me the name. Don't make me be a bad guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is. It is true. It's always like, like you'll never understand the sorrow that I feel having to make these choices, but I did it and I did it for you. Uh, there's, there's something in the book that the most striking thing to me, like the, of everything in the book is there a million different crazy things like scattered throughout its pages. At one point she talks about the Syrian civil war and says, you know, I was in awe of the bravery of the Syrian people. I wrote in my journal, where would I be if I were Syrian risking my life to try to win freedom for my family or keeping my head down so as, tried, as to try not to lose my family. And she, she's wondering if she, you know, she would have the courage to stand up to the Assad dictatorship. And what she leaves out is the third more likely possibility, which is that if she had been born in Syria, she would have been working for Assad. <laughs> and it's precisely because like, she can't imagine that, that she can't imagine that that's where she would end up, that indicates that, in fact, that is where she would be. Like, it's just certain people are drawn to these positions of power. And like even Michael Kinsley, like long ago, Michael Kinsley wrote something about the U.S. political system and said, like, if all of these people were in another country, a country that wasn't a democracy, you know, would they be standing up to the terrible government or would they be looking for their own place, like their own role to play in the terrible government? It's like almost all of them would be doing the latter. And like that's that's just the way people are. Like people who want to do these jobs are drawn to these jobs, no matter how terrible the government is here or anywhere else. 